Summit, excuse me, Summit, hosted by a grand alliance to save our public postal service. I'm Erica Taylor from Take On Wall Street, a Grand Alliance member, and I'll be leading you through the first day of our really important summit. So this is a critical moment for our national treasure, the United States Postal Service. But with your help, over the next three days, we'll create an agenda for the future of the Postal Service that serves our communities with expanded and enhanced services. We'll hear from engaging speakers and panelists, then we'll discuss obstacles and how to overcome them as we build the people's postal agenda. First, I'd like to tell you that this summit is being recorded and the panels will be posted on the Grand Alliance website this evening at 7 p.m. Some ground rules. All participants are muted, but there will be opportunities for you to respond during breakout sessions uh, when we ask, when you have some questions at some small groups. So we do invite you to, to, to do that. So you can, and you can, we also invite you to raise your hand to ask a question, which you can do either virtually or uh, literally by raising your hand in person. And then I'll call your name, you'll be asked to unmute yourself, and then you can speak. So don't forget, you can also react to comments with the buttons at the bottom of your screen, or send comments in the chat to the entire group or to individuals in the room. If for any reason we have unexpected and disruptive guests, we'll try to handle the situation as quickly as possible. However, in the event that something very disruptive happens, we may need to pause the program for a bit, but we will resume, so hang in there with us. So with all of that out of the way, our first welcoming remarks come from the president of the American Postal Workers Union. The APWU is a union which first convened the Grand Alliance in 2013 and has been the driving force behind its work and bringing together a broad coalition in defense of the Postal Service. He's been incredibly visible face of the postal service and the postal workers recently, and of really of everyone who relies on the postal service in this past tumultuous year. And he's here to kick us off and lead off our exciting agenda. It's a pleasure to introduce Mark Demonstein, president of the American Postal Workers Union. Well, solidarity greetings and a warm welcome to all the organizers, presenters, facilitators, and of course, the participants of the People's Postal Summit sponsored by a Grand Alliance to Save Our Public Postal Service. We very much appreciate all of your interest, your passion, and your ideas on the road forward for this wonderful national treasure that belongs to all the people and plays such an important role in our lives. The Public Postal Service is truly a democratic right of the people, as well as a source of good living wage, union jobs, and stronger communities. The timing couldn't be better. First, the Public Postal Service is at a fork in the road. Under the pressures of manufactured financial crisis, chronic understaffing, the pandemic, and over a decade of cut and slash management policies, will it end up in the hands of the Wall Street privatizers? Or will we, the people, chart a path forward of better, expanded, and vibrant public postal services for generations to come? Second, the Postal Service doesn't belong to any president, Congress, or the Postmaster General. It belongs to all of us. And it's up to us to create the people's postal agenda right at the very moment when postal management is due to release their 10 year strategic business plan. And third, crisis brings opportunity for building a better world. I'm confident with all of your participation, this summit will play an important role in protecting and defending the public postal service and build our work going forward to ensure that the United States Postal Service never becomes the United States Postal Business, but remains the United States Postal Service. So let's have a great and productive conference, uh, sisters, brothers, family, and friends. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Public Citizen and the founding member of a Grand Alliance, Rob Weissman. Public Citizen has been a rock solid defender of the Postal Service and has done incredible organizing of its members over the past years because they know saving the post office is a key struggle in defending the public interest. Hey, thanks, Erica. Brothers and sisters, it's an honor to be with you um, for this important summit this opportunity to reflect on the value of the Postal Service, but to build the, the way forward, not just to defend it, 
but to improve and expand and entrench it in, in our lives. Um, Erica and Mark both have already referred to the Postal Service as a national treasure. I just wanted, which is obviously true, but I wanted to reflect for a minute on what makes it a national treasure. And I just wanted to highlight three things that trace back to its origins all the way up to the present, three aspects of the Postal Service that are so unique in American life. The first thing is that it connects us, right? It's been the instrument of national mass communication, a way for us to come together across the country, but also a way for us to come together in towns and communities across the country and a physical presence. You know, this pandemic has shown us the importance of long distance communication and virtual communication, but reminds us every freaking moment that we really miss being together and that we need to be able to come together. And the post offices do that for us and have done that for us. A second, I think, just defining feature of the Postal Service is that it is an inclusive institution. Right? It has been this ticket forward into the middle class for so many people, especially from African-American and Latino families. But it's inclusive of all parts of the country, right? And it's such a central institution in rural parts of the country that they, they themselves are being increasingly left out of the bigger American project. So the interest in maintaining, defending, expanding the Postal Service touches all of the most vulnerable and marginalized communities in this country and unites them in ways that overcome a lot of the sort of false divides that have been imposed upon us by the corporate class. And the third thing I think that's so unique about the Postal Service is, as Brother Damon Stan was saying, it is a public institution. It is a fundamentally public institution serving public purposes, this core democratic interest. And as we know, that is why it is under such great assault, because the a variety of corporate interests are try, interested in extracting profit from it, not serving the broad mission of connecting and inclusion, but just taking out the profitable parts and serving themselves. Um, so it has these three defining elements that are they're so fundamental and really so unique that impose on us the duty to make sure we maintain it and defend it. In the course of the summit over the next three days is gonna be an opportunity for all of us to have conversations about the immediate agenda to defend it and fix the problems that have been imposed on it, including by a postmaster general who aims to sabotage the service he leads, but also not to just get caught up in this immediate short-term urgent needs, but think on a broader horizon about what the post office of the future can and should look like to continue those core key functions of connection and inclusion and public service, whether it's postal banking or internet service or developing uh, and providing services that we haven't yet even imagined, really the opportunities are endless and it's an, an opportunity for us to, in these three days to help do that thinking together. As, as Mark was saying, the attack on the postal service, which has obviously been long running but became so acute over this last year as Trump tried to sabotage it, not just to serve the privatizing interest, but serve his election theft interests. That gave us an opportunity to build interest in the Postal Service and a movement that was shocking in its breath across the country and an in intensity of the feeling. So we have a moment now that we can't let go. I'm so excited that this conference has come together, the summit has come together to capitalize on that moment and drive us forward. We have a lot of work together to do, and this is gonna be a great launching pad continuation, but also a launching path for, for what's to come. Um, one last word. I just want to thank all of you for participating. I just want to especially acknowledge the role of the APWU. You know, it's you have a, 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 a natural interest, obviously, in maintaining the office for, for your members, but the, def, the definition of it as a public institution, the bringing together of so many allies to defend this public institution, it's not what every labor union does. It's not what every public interest organization does. It's not what every church does, every business. It is a unique thing and it's uh, a tribute to the insight of the, the leadership of the union and the membership of the union that have demanded it. And so thank you for, for all your leadership 
uh, Mark and the team, but everybody on the call um, from the APWU. Um, we are so happy and proud to be working alongside and with you. And I, I'm very confident that together we're going to make great things happen for the USPS. Thanks so much, Erica. Thank you. Thank you for those great words, Rob. For the next introductory comment, I'd like to introduce Josh Gray, the Vice President of Strategic Alliances and Policy at the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, which is another founding organization of a Grand Alliance. Josh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon all, and thank you so much. I'm actually speaking on behalf of Melanie Campbell, the president and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and the National Convener of Black Women's Roundtable. Again, Erica, we're so humbled to be here today. And we're also just a proud uh, founding member of A Grand Alliance. You know, over the years, we've struggled with so many like you to defend the postal service from attempts to privatize, reduce service and close postal facilities. It has been more, it has been an important struggle for our coalition because we know how important the postal service is in communities we represent. Protecting and expanding the postal office, fully funding, protecting workers, making sure they have their workplace protections and affordable union is imperative. That helps secure, in addition to helping secure in our election systems, in pushing back against foul play. We've seen this importance. We've seen that we've seen the importance of postal service through elections and through democracy just last year. We also know we're in this critical moment. When so much is at stake for the future of postal service, we need to come together to promote a vision for a post office that serves everyone and continues to be the bedrock and in institution of our communities. It's not just you, it's not just me, it's all of us that represents the Postal Service. So we're just excited to be here today at this conference for the next three days to learn from each other, to take what, we, what we've gathered, to be that advocate, be that support system, to be that family. So thank you again from the family of the NCBCP and Black Women's Roundtable. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you for those words and for stepping in for Melanie. It's very, very generous. So next, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. Now, you may know him as an award-winning actor, but we love him for his decades of activism and struggle for social justice. He's a proud son of postal workers and the face of a Grand Alliance, Danny Glover. Thank you very much, um, Erica, and, and certainly as a, a one of the founding members of the um, the Grand Alliance, it's such an honor to be here and, and to see my, my brothers and sisters, and uh, my, my comrades um, um, participate in this particular, this particular moment and come together at this particular time and, and out, of, uh, out of a real challenge, a real challenge that has been with us a long time. We may not have, have embraced the depth of the challenge against the, 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 people's, the people's democracy. The people's democracy lies within the post office itself. It was the first lesson I learned as a child, as a young child, as my, my, my parents gravitated around not only what was happening within the civil rights movement, but also what was happening in, in, the, in the movement around organized labor and organized the voices around that. And the post office was centered to that. They were almost synonymous to me, the movement and the post office as they want you watching that since. When Reagan came to power, uh, President Reagan came to power, he said the problem is government. That was always the problem. To, and the, and the, 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 the tense or the very insidious attempt to shift the responsibility from the public space where we have control of it within a democracy to privatize it. And that, that battle has been going on and on, but these, the post office is a, the strongest visible process that happens in the public space for us. That we have, that it's our place where we find where real democracy works. And, and, and it's also, if we also find that also the, the role that ordinary citizens plays within that 
because through through the the A W U P U the role that they play through that is an essential role in sustaining that democracy, and I, I'm I'm excited to be here as we embark on this particular moment, this critical moment, critical moment. We may have been challenged by the last election that just occurred this past November, but we have a larger challenge ahead of us in terms of turning back or reimagining our responsibility and reimagining the work that the post office can do for us as ordinary citizens, those who, those who, who don't have often access, access, ordinary citizens. And I want to believe, I want to believe that we're all here in the service of that, and certainly I am and continue to be with you and stand with you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. You know, I, if we're in the olden times, I'm sure that the, the crowd would be erupting, you know, after all those, uh, that wonderful, uh, those wonderful remarks and the remarks of, of, of the previous speaker. So thank you for that. So next, we're going to move over uh, on into the agendas for the first three days or the, the entire three days of the summit. So here's a reminder of the ways to participate. Uh, and then today's agenda, we've uh, just wrapped our opening remarks. Uh, and in a moment, we'll transition to some uh, to a little break, uh, icebreaker to hear a bit from you. We'll next move to the panel discussion on the making of a crisis. Uh, and then a second panel discussion on the future of the postal network. We'll shift into some breakout sessions and then wrap up for the day. Tomorrow, uh, we'll come right back at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, and we'll start off with the risk of privatization. And then we'll move into a panel discussion about financial services. We'll uh, end the day again with breakout sessions before coming back together as a group to wrap up tomorrow. And then our final day on Thursday, uh, we'll start, kick off with a panel discussion on the Postal Service and Democratic Rights. You know, that's been referred to a bit earlier today. And then we'll move into a panel discussion on the Postal Service and vibrant communities. We'll again move into breakout sessions and then come back together one final time to wrap up. So next, as I mentioned, there is an icebreaker coming up. I'm going to bring in uh, Vi Diamond Ward, excuse me, Vi Ward Diamond, a postal worker from Cleveland and the leader of the APWU Collective Action Teams. Vi is going to get our blood flowing with a short icebreaker. Vi, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. What a wonderful group. We're pleased that you are here and your feedback is valuable. Please take a few seconds to tell us the organization you're with and why you're here, what you expect or hope to get out of this summit. As Erica told you earlier, you can raise your hand using the Zoom function or raise it physically. Okay, I think we have uh, Mark Dutson. Thanks for starting our icebreaker. Yeah, sorry, had, had a little trouble unmuting there, but thank you so much for holding this, uh, this conference. This is really exciting. So I work on single payer healthcare and I just think that, you know, the postal service is the granddaddy of public goods. It's enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. And uh, all of us who are concerned about defending and expanding and decommodifying public goods, our fights will rise and fall with the fate of the Postal Service. So I'm really glad to be here. I'm really impressed that um, in response to the attacks on the Postal Service, you know, your vision is to turn the tables and um, demand a better Postal Service that serves the public even better. And I think that that's a brilliant strategy to build this movement. So I'm looking to um, uh, connect with these, these fights and to learn from all of you and then figure out how we can apply some of these lessons to the fights that uh, I wage around healthcare justice. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next person is Scott Klinger. Thanks, Vi. I'm Scott Klinger. I'm with Jobs with Justice. I'm also an associate fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, and along with my IPS colleagues, Sarah Anderson, we're the co-authors of the discussion draft on the vision for the 21st century post office that was on the registration page. And um, I would like to echo the things that my friend Rob Weissman said about the characteristics of the post office and add a fourth one, that the post office has innovated to meet unmet public needs. And that's what I hope, uh, enjoy listening to all of our upcoming speakers and listening especially 
to the feedback of the rest of the audience on ideas for how we can uh, really harness the power of the post office's historic uh, innovation. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Next, we have Linda Sherry. Mute. Hi, Linda Sherry from Consumer Action. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to get together with uh, supporters of the USPS. Uh, in this digital universe, we really need to preserve people's rights to paper and snail mail, and we need to give the USPS the resources it needs to succeed. We also need to fight all and every privatization attempt. The post office belongs to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Next, we have Jim Kaufman. Hi, I'm the legislative director for the American Postal Workers Union in Albany, New York retired postal worker. And Linda, I, I wish we wouldn't call it snail mail. I, I have to defend it every time I hear someone say that. Um, it's, it's what I call pure mail. Um, I'm here to learn as much as I can. I, I was on a call months ago that had some hundred people or so. Uh, I think it was a, a similar call to this. And uh, I was amazed at the support from so many organizations. And uh, it will really be it's important to me to know what can be done and who can do it. And the APW can do so much, but we need the community at large to support us. Because if, uh, if it's just the union coming out for the, the postal service, people say, well, you have an agenda. But if it's the American public coming out for the postal service, it adds weight to the argument. Thank you. I have to let my dog bark. Thank you, Jim. Next, we have Richard Fiesta. Hello, thanks. I'm Rich Fiesta with the Alliance for Retired Americans and uh, proud to be here. We are a um, proud uh, member of the Grand Alliance uh, and proud that APWU is a participating member with us. But for millions, literally almost 50 million older Americans, the Postal Service is literally, literally a lifeline. Millions of prescriptions are in the postal system every week. And it's important for us to keep that lifeline alive and better and improving uh, because a day, even a day's delay can affect the health and welfare of many, many seniors, uh, not only of their age, but of people across uh, all ages as well. So especially in smaller towns and smaller communities as well. So for us, it's important that this enshrined institution from our constitutional founding days, stay well and get better. And we're just glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Next, we have Kelly Dickey. Hi, my name is Kelly Dickey. I am the local president of the National Postal Mail Handler Union 322, Western Pennsylvania. Um, again, honored to be here. Um, hope to get a lot of information. And I'd hope to touch on a little bit, we're seeing that approximately 30 to 35% of uh, mail handlers are now, have been hired in the last six years. So a way to help engage and actually get them motivated to help us with our endeavors such as this. So that's all. Thank you, Kelly. I think we have time for Cynthia McNeil. Yes, um, I'm Cynthia McNeil and I'm the Oklahoma Postal Workers Legislative Director. And in, in these times, it seems like the economic and the technical disparity has continued to grow in the United States. And the Postal Service is what connects us. And, um, you know, we connect the disenfranchised, the homebound rural communities, particularly in Oklahoma, and hopefully soon the underbanked. And, um, that's why I'm on this, so I can learn how we can keep America connected. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, next, we have Mike Kavanaugh. Hey, everybody. I'm Mike Kavanaugh. I'm with the Labor Network for Sustainability. Uh, we are an organization of union organizers and climate activists who are working to try to build a relationship between these movements. And I just, I'm so glad that we're here because I think the APWU and the whole Grand Alliance model of a labor movement that is so engaged with the community and that we have sort of a, a, a fight together for the common good is so critically important. That's true on fight to save the postal service. 
it's frankly true on the fight to save the climate. And uh, I'm really glad to be here with our organization, working with all of you. Thank you, Mike. I think that's it, Erica. Excellent. Thanks for leading us through that, Vi. So we're ready to move on to our first panel, which is the making of a crisis and the road ahead with Monique Morrissey from the Economic Policy Institute and Judy Beard, who's the legislative and political director at the APWU. So Monique, you'll lead us off. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Monique Morrissey of the Economic Policy Institute. I'm also a union member, uh, so very thrilled to be among other uh, brothers and sisters, and the great granddaughter of a village postmistress. Um, and the, the Postal Service is very dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to be distilling a very long report. I will uh, share my screen so you can see the link to it. I'm going to go very fast because I have eight minutes. Um, but uh, if you want to get more into the weeds, you can always go and check out the original report. Uh, let me see, share screen. Um, can I share my screen? Let's see. Maybe I won't be sharing my screen. Let's see. Share. Okay. Okay. I think. Can everybody see that? Yes. All right. Um, okay. So uh, Judy is going to talk more about the specifics of the legislation, uh, the the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006. So we're coming up on 15 years of this act. And I think most people on this call, if they're aware of it, think that at least most of it should be dismantled. Um, but it, the, the PAEA didn't come out of nowhere um, and it has persisted for 15 years, even though virtually uh, the year after it passed, it became apparent that it was causing serious problems, including even sort of neutral observers like the Congressional Research Service were pointing out some serious flaws in the PAEA. Um, but it was a long time coming and it has persisted for 15 years. Um, and that leads us to ask why is, you know, why is the Postal Service a perpetual battleground and what are the forces at play that got us here? Um, and so that's what I'll be talking about. And I think Judy is going to talk more specific about, you know, about Congress and uh, specific legislation. And I'm going to take a very big picture view of this. Um, so uh, infamously, uh, the PAEA introduced uh, owner's reti uh, health, retiree health benefit prefunding requirement, basically requiring the Postal Service to fund 75 years worth of health, uh, retiree health benefits in the space of 10 years. Um, it also limited uh, price increases on postage at a time when the number of addresses that needed to be serviced were increasing, but mail, paper mail volume was declining. Um, and it re formally restricted the Postal Service to, to traditional activities like postal delivery, selling stamps, and prevented it from doing things that we're going to talk about later in this summit, like offering uh, financial services or enhanced financial services. Um, and all of these things were detrimental to the Postal Service, and we need to change them. Um, so why is the Postal Service perpetually seem to be under attack? One, it's very big. It's the biggest civilian agency. Two, it's very popular, always leads, you know, top lists of, of the most popular federal agencies. Uh, and this is bipartisan, and it's especially popular in rural districts. Um, and three, and most importantly, I think what I'm going to talk about is it competes with the private sector. Um, and so basically, there are these special interests that want to dismantle it in whole or in part, um, and that is a toxic mix. So you have very big, it's got a target on its back, it's very popular. So people who are against government want to make it look bad, and it competes with private sector interests. So we can call the private sector interests and anti-government ide uh, ideologues an unholy alliance. This is what Teddy Roosevelt once called them, in, I think in uh, 1912. He also mentioned that some of this unholy alliance, alliance often works in secret, and this happens also with the Postal Service. So we all have our eyes on the dismantling aspects of the PAA and other changes, but there's also things that go on behind the scenes. For example, uh, the, uh, these special interests often work uh, in special advisory councils behind the scenes in closed door um, meetings with even postal management to influence the Postal Service. Um, 
why is there an ideological vendetta against the Postal Service? Um, the, what Teddy Roosevelt talked about is basically just corruption, that, that, that politicians are corrupt and they're in league with big money. But I actually believe that when it comes to the Postal Service, there are true believers. So we, some other people will talk later about um, privatization um, attempts through libertarian think tanks. I think some of those people are sincere. I also think that members of my profession, economists, often assume that that the private, the, the, pub, the markets work better than government. And some of the public believes this too. And this is one of the reasons the PAEA was especially pernicious because it caused the Postal Service to lose money and then to appear like it was broken or inefficient. And this gets repeated even by neutral observers, even people who don't have an animus or aren't anti-Postal Service, but they just believe there's something inherently wrong with the Postal Service, as opposed to that the Postal Service is operating with severe constraints that no other public or private organization is, is operating under. Um, why are libertarians opposed to the Postal Service when it's not taxpayer funded? What, you know, what are their problems? Well, they have all kinds of, uh, and I go into this in my report, all kinds of pseudo uh, reasons. Uh, legitimately, they could say, well, the Postal Service is a monopoly, and so that could be a, uh, they could charge higher prices than they need to or not be as efficient as they need to be. Um, and also the very fact that, that they have single pricing uh, creates distortions in the market. And again, people like economists, certain kinds of economists are big believers that the market should operate as much as possible in an unfettered way. Um, but the problem is that the markets only work really well, and this is also, again, in theory, when they're very competitive. There's nothing about the, the uh, sphere in which the Postal Service operates or its competitors and its customers that is competitive. These are not competitive markets. Delivery systems are natural monopolies. There are high fixed costs, there are barriers to entry, there are network efficiencies. Under any circumstances, it would have to be heavily regulated, even if it was a private sector entity, as it is in some European countries. Um, it also is a statutory monopoly, and every this is a long history, and this is an international thing that that governments have given postal services monopolies in order to protect, in order to make sure that underserved areas like rural areas get that um, get get services, and also to expand the network throughout the country when they're for nation building purposes. So this is not unique to the United States. Um, you could theoretically have a private. Uh, postal service and you could regulate it heavily, but there's no particular advantage to it because if you think the government is inefficient, it's going to be an inefficient regulator. You might as well just do it directly. Um, but I think that what most of the people on this call and I myself agree with is that more importantly than all those sort of theoretical reasons why it should be a public service is that the public that the public postal service is too important to leave to self-interest, to private sector, to money-making entities. We believe it should be a democratic public service for fairness reasons. People's ability to, to take advantage of these services shouldn't be depend on their ability to pay. Uh, the cost shouldn't reflect the cost if you live in, in Kotzebue, Alaska, or uh, you shouldn't have to pay more. And also because it's a these are positions of public trust, and this will be fleshed out much more by other panelists later on, but we really trust postal workers to do their jobs for reasons other than self-interest. And that trust is very important in postal service. Um, who are these special interests that are always at war or at least trying to nibble away at the Postal Service? They're major customers, they're major competitors, and increasingly they're both customers and competitors. So when you think of customers, you might have thought in the old days it would have been Sears Roebuck. Uh, major competitors, you might have thought in the old days it's UPS. Um, but really what we're looking at now is mostly something like Amazon, which has its own delivery network, but is also a major customer. So these companies like Amazon, they're not operating in competitive environments and they have every incentive to meddle with the postal service to try to influence the, the legislation, to try to influence regulation and try to work influence management practices behind the scenes through advisory groups, through industry advisory groups. Sorry. Um, and counter to these, uh, I realize I'm sort of running out of time, but I will just say very quickly, what we have to push back against these special interests are households, small businesses, and workers. These interests are more diffuse, but they do have representation. Households have representation in Congress, especially rural areas, which are dis disproportionately represented in Congress, which is usually a bad thing, but in terms of protecting the Postal Service, it's a good thing. Uh, small business associations, I think they're kind of weak, but they still they function. And the most important of all are workers and unions. And again, I'm a proud member of a union. I think you, uh, 
but I think that, that unions have historically taken too much of the job of having to defend the Postal Service, which is why this Grand Alliance is so important. Very quickly, critics will tend to frame the issue as government inefficiency or unfair competition. These are somewhat contradictory. The, the, the critiques are addressed to different groups of people. The, gov the unfair competition is usually something that's the, told to regulators. Government inefficiency is something that they try to convince the public is happening when the Postal Service fails. Fortunately, we've seen that even with a saboteur like uh, the current Postmaster General, the general public is so in, uh, in love with this Postal Service that they see through this. So even with, um, you know, that they don't really believe that the, the Postal Service is inefficient or bad, but this is an ongoing attempt to make the Postal Service look bad. Um, so are we safe from these problems? Are critics shouting into the wind? We'll t hear more in the future about how there have been attempts by the Trump administration and many predecessors to pr formally privatize the Postal Service, to just go, you know, there was a task, special task force to talk about privatizing the, so the Postal Service. And a lot of times we, you know, these things happen and then afterwards we think, well, it hasn't happened. Phew, we're safe. It's too popular. It, there doesn't have any public support. What I want to leave you with is that it's very important to look not just at how at overt attempts to privatize the public uh, sector, including the Postal Service, Social Security, and other beloved public institutions, but covert behind the scenes or backdoor attempts to do the same. So you can have these uh, front as frontal assaults on the Postal Service fail, and at the same time, you could have a lot of outsourcing and shrinking of the Postal Service that's happening behind the scenes through the influence of these special interests. And that is what we need to be more aware of and more cautious of. And I think one good way to do that is to have a prospective and visionary agenda. And that is what this People's Postal Service uh, Summit is about. And I look forward to participating more uh, and hearing more about these visionary uh, and um, proactive rather than just defensive uh, agenda. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that, Monique. That's such helpful uh, historical context and background and uh, and good words of wisdom for moving forward and how to be cautious as we as we advance. So next up, we have Judy Beard. Judy, go ahead. It's your floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Erica. Um, first, I would like to extend a thanks to the Grand Alliance to Save Our Public Postal Service. Our APWU members are proud that we we're one of the building organizations. We are fighting alongside all of you to keep the United States mail, the People's Post Office. I have been asked to focus on its mission, function, some challenges, share some good news at our current legislation tax. The mission of the Postal Service is to provide the nation with reliable, affordable, universal mail service. Its function is spelled out in section 101 of, the, of Title 39 of the US Code. And it states that its obligation is to bind the nation together to provide prompt and reliable and efficient services. Now we know today the mail is not prompt, it's not reliable. But we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is happening. The USPS delivers everywhere in this country, 157 million addresses, no matter who we are or where we live. Our challenges start dated back to the creation of the United States Postal Service. It was first the post office department back in 1775, but with the passage of the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, uh, our troubles continued to build. We became self-supporting, self-funding, owned by the federal government and required to financially break even. We paid our bills faithfully from the sale of our product. We, in the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, um, they also established the Postal Regulatory Commission and the Postal Board of Governors. 
We have some good news. Um, we know about the Postal Board of Governors. They're the ones that selected the Postmaster General under the law. We know that um, our President of the United States have nominated three additional members to the Postal Board of Governors. But, and that's good. That's good that we will have uh, a full board soon. And the board takes the responsibility to make some serious decisions. In the 116th Congress, um, the United States Fairness Act, HR 2882, was introduced by Representative DeFazio. And Monique mentioned um, that the PAEA, Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, established uh, this law in 2006, established a requirement for the Postal Service to make this pre-funding that is ridiculous of re retiree health care. 10, 75 years out, that's how ridiculous, at over $5 billion uh, a year. Post office could not pay uh, that after 2012. And um, this HR, um, this bill, HR 2382, the USPS Fairness Act, it was introduced in the House, it passed in the House, but it didn't just pass by one party. It passed with 309 votes, yes, and 106 no. And 87 Republicans voted for uh, these, this U.S. Fairness Act of uh, H.R. 2382. It's important because we knew that the post office is not a party issue. It's a people's issue, regardless of what party you belong to. And um, just recently, in the 117th Congress, the USPS Fairness Act has already been introduced, but it was introduced in a different way than most bills are introduced. The original signatures came up to 248 the day it was introduced with bipartisan support. The same day or a day later, the Senate bill was introduced and the Senate bill is S-145. So the House bill is H.R. 695 in this Congress and the Senate bill is Senate Bill 145. So with that kind of bipartisan support, uh, to try to relieve the Postal Service of that $5 billion a year that they, you know, were required to pay and stop paying in 2012 uh, is really good because the post office books shows uh, over $80 billion worth of debt, but 83% of it is because $80 billion worth of debt because of, of of, of the PAEA and 80% and of that debt is because of the uh, um, postal enhancement and, and accountability and enhancement at the pre-funding requirement that nobody else has to pay, that the post office paid as you go prior to that. And it's totally ridiculous to be paying 75 years out before people are born. We've had other victories. Uh, we had a victory uh, in December when um, the relief bill passed, giving the Postal Service uh, an opportunity not to pay back the $10 billion that was in the um, CARES Act that passed last March, um, not to pay it back. And uh, instead of uh, the $10 billion that we did not have to pay back, uh, we knew that House bills had passed uh, saying that the Postal Service should get $25 billion uh, COVID related. And um, when the bill passed in December, we heard many members of Congress and many legislators say that that was just a down payment. 
So we would like to see the additional funding for the Postal Service. There are a couple other things that we would like to see. In the infrastructure bill, we would like to see $25 billion for the Postal Service. That will help the Postal Service not only pay for you know, more vehicles, it will also help the Postal Service remodel some of the post offices that exist today and maybe even add you know, ATM machines at business centers with computers in it. There's an appropriation bill coming up and we know that the mail is slow. We know why it's slow. One of the reasons is COVID related. You know, a lot of our employees are off work. Some of it deals with managers making bad decisions. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why the mail is slow. A lot of employees uh, never got replaced after they retired. So uh, in the appropriations bill coming up in the House, uh, we're, we hope that they put language in there for improving the service standards, as well as uh, some money in it for um, a pilot program for postal banking or postal financial services. Recently, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, chaired by um, Representative Carolyn Maloney, Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney, uh, she introduced a document called a discussion paper. And that discussion paper is similar to um, a postal reform bill, but it hasn't got that far yet. It's like the first step of the Postal Reform Bill. And in it, it has language in it on service standards, on Medicare integration, and it has the U.S. Fairness Act uh, on the pre-funding of the retiree health care. Uh, and it's a bill that um, all four postal unions are looking at. It's not a bill. It's a discussion document that all four postal unions are looking at. And we're gonna make some suggestions to her committee on improvements to it. Um, I'd like to um, end by uh, letting you know that we still need your help. We still need money for the postal service. It is the people's post office and uh, we will keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That was so helpful, and really, that that pre that prefunding mandate is no joke. So that's a big a big threat here. So thanks to you, Judy and Monique, both. Um, next, we're going to hear from Sarah Anderson from the Institute for Policy Studies. So Sarah and her team at IPS have taken the lead on starting a draft of a white paper that this co conference will culminate with. So Sarah is going to walk us through a quick overview of where we stand in creating our vision for the future of the Postal Service and how this conference fits in. Hey everybody, thank you, Erica. Yeah, I see my job here today is really sparking your imagination by sharing some of these initial thoughts about what a people's postal agenda could look like. And I'm going to share a slideshow about that. So just let me get that set up. But yeah, it's been so exciting to be able to shift from being in defense mode for several years, helping to defend the public postal service from all of these attacks and being able to, to shift now to being proactive and positive and think about all the exciting things we could do with this incredible um, national treasure, I think, I think we've been calling the postal service uh, today. So before I get into the specific ideas about where we might go, I wanted to remind you first that the Postal Service has long been a driver of innovation. Uh, so in 1897, they introduced rural free delivery. This helped knit rural and urban communities um, together and expanded markets, benefiting the, the broader economy. In 1913, they introduced parcel post. So uh, they started delivering packages and that created the mail order catalog industry and laid the foundation for today's e-commerce. In 1918, uh, they introduced air mail service. So that sped up deliveries and then also benefited the broader economy by laying the foundation for the commercial aviation industry. 
So there's a long, rich history of innovation in the Postal Service. And what we want you to do this week is think hard about where we want to go in the 21st century. I also have a family history in the Postal Service. My grandfather actually started delivering the mail on horseback in North Dakota. And I think about that and I'm amazed at all of the Postal Service has achieved and all the innovations they've made since that time. And I think the goal for us uh, in these next three days is to think about what we want the Postal Service to look like in 5, 10, or 20 years from now. So we'll be able to look back uh, and be similarly amazed by how far we've come since 2021. So what are some of the ideas out there about how the Postal Service could expand in ways to even more uh, strongly meet the, the needs of our uh, today's society? Well, one idea that has a lot of energy and we'll be devoting tomorrow to this is expanding financial services. So low income and especially low income communities of color don't have to rely on predatory financial firms. Another uh, area that where there's a lot of interest is looking at how the Postal Service could be a key driver of the shift to a clean renewable energy economy. So there's a lot of talk these days about replacing the vehicle fleet with ele electric vehicles. We could also have more solar panels installed on post offices. We could have charging stations at post offices. And while I'm on the trucks, there's also very creative ideas about putting um, monitors on these trucks um, to monitor uh, indicators of uh, community safety and government services from potholes to pollution. They could be um, gathering data about these and transmitting it back to governments to make our community safer and governments um, more effective. We could also think about what role the Postal Service might play in the strength and care infrastructure that we know we so badly need in this country. The Postal Service uh, can't, can't do everything, obviously, but they, they could play a role here. And this is an image from a program in France where postal workers have a system where they check in on the elderly and the disabled. They ask them uh, questions about their welfare and then they transmit that information to family members and caregivers and social service agencies. It's a way to help people uh, continue to live independently at home. Uh, our democracy, boy, did we get a lesson over the past year and what a vital role the Postal Service plays in protecting our democracy in a pandemic, but, but in other times as well to help counter racist voter suppression. And so there are a lot of ideas on how we can build on the incredible job the Postal Service did last, did last year with Vote by Mail uh, to expand that nationwide. We also got a really tough lesson last year about the digital divide and how wide that is still in the richest country in the world. So what do you think? Could the Postal Service with its vast uh, network across the country help anchor an initiative to eliminate the digital divide, especially in underserved rural communities? We've been talking about how the Postal Service has uh, for so long been a provider of decent jobs with, with benefits. I think a critical part of a people's postal agenda will be to uh, ensure that all postal workers have good benefits and security and the right to collective bargaining. It's especially important for um, uh, black workers who make up uh, nearly 25% of the postal workforce. Protecting public health, wow, we really got an eye opener over the past year in what an, a vital role the Postal Service played in helping people socially distance uh, by uh, staying at home instead of uh, going shopping as much in stores. Uh, what about the, the coming crises? Could the Postal Service play an even more strategic role? Could they help out with contact tracing, for example? Or what about having post offices become community wellness centers where you could go to get your blood uh, pressure checked and get uh, information about different kinds of uh, health programs that are available to you. Another big thing that happened over the last year is that Americans became even more dependent on e-commerce and that is probably going to continue. So I think again, a part of the 
people's postal agenda needs to be to make sure that our postal service maintains its universal service obligation, um, delivering affordable, reliable service, uh, no matter where people live. Finally, what about uh, small farmers and people who need uh, easier access to healthy food? Could the Postal Service play a role in that? We're gonna hear some more specific ideas about that from one of our other panelists. So those are some of the uh, ideas in the discussion paper that we prepared for this conference. Um, you should have a link to it in your registration materials. And here's what you can do to be a part of this process. One thing is you can review that full paper and um, over the next few days, we wanna hear your thoughts about it. What about uh, these ideas excites you? What do you think is not, not that exciting? What, what's missing altogether? How, how can we really strengthen this people's postal agenda in ways that, that will be really exciting and inspiring to people across the country? We're going to be taking really careful notes in the breakout sessions and from the chat box too. There's already been some good ideas in the chat box and we're going to be working to incorporate those new ideas to make that paper a lot better. Um, if you'd also like to submit some written comments, you can send them to my colleague Brian at this address and this address is also on the last page of the, the paper. So you don't have to rush to write it down right now um, and try to do that over the next couple of weeks. Um, you'll also want to make sure that you're staying connected so you can sign up for news about this process and, and alerts about it um, through the info at grandalliance.org. And then what the idea is, is we're going to take all this input, we're going to strengthen this people's postal agenda, and we'll be, we'll be helping to organize a launch event um, and then starting to organize collectively around this agenda. There are so many people who are excited to see this paper. There are members of Congress, there are officials in the Biden administration who know that this conference is happening this week, are so excited to see the agenda that we're gonna produce out of it because we all share the, the common goal of you know, building on all the in innovation over the past centuries um, in ways that can ensure that the public postal service continues to serve all American people for many generations to come. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah. That was really inspirational. Um, it's great to be thinking about the, the, you know, the future, as you said, to, to no longer be on the defense and be looking at, at uh, how we can move forward. So we're gonna jump right into our next panel, uh, but not to worry, we will have time for questions for all of our panelists at the end. So, our next panel features two speakers who can give us some examples of new and interesting ways to use the postal network to better serve our community. Some, some of the things that Sarah was just talking about. So first up is Ian Kerr. Ian Kerr is the founder and host of the Postal Hub podcast and a well-known commentator and analyst on global postal and delivery trends. He's also one half of the Last Mile Profits of producing videos and webinars focusing on the last mile. Then following Ian, we'll have Julie Koenig from the World Wildlife Foundation. The WWF USA recently published this interesting business case for what they're calling Farmer's Post, I think what Sarah was just referencing. And that's a way to get fresh fruits and vegetables to your doorstep in no time with the Postal Service. So Ian, you're up first, please take it away. Hello everybody. And uh, I apologize for my lack of slides. I thought I'd just give you the glorious experience of just being part of this with me. One too many as we are today. Um, I guess I wanted to focus on some positive things today to talk about some of the opportunities that are out there for the post office in the USA and what we can look at from around the world. As we've heard everybody say so far, the post has an undeniable social role, whether it's being a hub in a community through a post office or through reaching out to people via the delivery networks. And that's is important when we look at the opportunities that are out there 
in the postal world. So things that we can do to enhance what we currently do in the postal in, in the postal business. I know I've used the word business and that might be a little bit verboten in this discussion, but let's just think about it that way in terms of being a, a business or a social business, perhaps is another way of, call, of putting it. Uh, I also just want to mention that the Rob Post does have an important role for the digitally disadvantaged. Maybe we're going to get to that in the panel, but let's just talk about some really big key concepts here. To be a world-class post, you need to have the best people, you need to have the best network, and I mean both post offices and last mile network, and that has to be backed up by the best tech. And that's a key thing in the 21st century. We can't rely on the emotion that people feel for us, that feel for our, our networks, for our people, we need to also have that backed up with the best tech. And that's it. I was just mentioned in that previous presentation about e-commerce. I'd like to quickly talk about e-commerce. The post has a reach that the other carriers admire. And I think that's been laid out quite clearly by one of the earlier speakers talking about it from an economical perspective. That is an advantage that needs to be leveraged properly by every single postal operator in the world. By it's using its ability to reach out to the smallest eBay seller through to the biggest e-commerce behemoth. Now from, uh, let's put the behemoths to one side because they can look after themselves, but there's a great role to be played for those small e-commerce sellers, those small businesses, whether eBay sellers, local producers, they have an easy place to lodge. What I mean by that is they can drop their parcels off at the post office, but we need to have the best tech, right? So it comes back to the tech. If you don't have the, the technology at the post office counter, to be able to quickly accept parcels, to be able to do that initial lodgement scan. And these are crucial things in modern e-commerce and we need to be delivering that at a very high quality. Uh, pricing comes into this as well, but maybe we'll come, in, come back to that later because otherwise we'll disappear down a rabbit hole and never surface again. Government and identity services. Now we have been talking about government and identity services in post offices since, since Adam was a boy. Now, I'm tired of talking about it, I've got to say, but the opportunity is still there because the message hasn't necessarily got through to every single government in the world. Already we see that uh, post offices around the world are offering things like passport applications, passport renewals, driver's licenses, uh, security checks. So it might be whether it's in Australia, we have working with children checks. Uh, there might be other kinds of identity checks that can be done at the post office. You have a great network. It's a trusted network. And this is another key thing. The trusted aspect of the post office network is the envy of every other network out there. The only other network that could possibly come close, I suppose, might be the pharmacists, perhaps. But are they out there in the numbers and with the strength of the common network that the post office has? I won't, so government and identity services are a key thing that needs to be looked at. Another one is the role of post offices when it comes to the pickup and lodgement of parcels. Now, I'm not talking about by an e-commerce seller. I'm talking about those end recipients. So when you're checking out from your favorite e-commerce website, what options do you have at the moment? You have home delivery. You may have parcel locker delivery. But what about delivery direct to the post office? The post office is a secure network for parcels. I, I, mean, I laugh when I hear about other networks trying to say, oh, we're a PUDO network. Pick up, PUDO means pick up, drop off or an access point. I'm sorry, it's probably more of a, a US term. Uh, but do, are any of them set up for parcels? No, they're not. But the post office network is. So we need to take full advantage of that. And again, this comes back to the tech. Right? So the tech enables the post office to be that pick up, drop off point. A question that I pose to everybody here today is this, should the post office only be a delivery point for parcels that originate within the US Postal Service? Or could it be a delivery point for parcels from other carriers? Could FedEx or UPS drop off parcels at the post office for collection? Of course, the Postal Service gets a fee for it, but could it work? I'm not gonna say yay or nay on that one, but I'll be interested to hear people's perspective Let's move away from the post office now to the delivery network. Again, the post office has, the US Postal Service has the best delivery network in the USA, right? Now I'm not just saying that because I'm a guest here, okay? 
Okay, partially, maybe I am. But in all seriousness, who else delivers to every address in the country? It's the same story in every other postal network in the world. Who else does it? It's a strength, but if that strength is not leveraged, you run the risk of becoming the deliverer of last resort. And that is not a situation you want to find yourself in. Because well, for various reasons. I don't want to, I've only got eight minutes and I'm told that Erica will just cut me off brutally if I go over time. Oh, you laugh, Erica. You can laugh. I know the truth. So a few key things here. Number one, ensuring the quality of letters. Letter volumes are not likely to grow. But if the quality of the letter service declines, in other words, the ability to deliver on time as promised, if that quality declines, then letter volumes will surely follow. That is a crucial thing. This is about being able to meet that delivery promise, right? whatever that delivery promise might be. Second key point when it comes to delivery is having the best in class interactive delivery management or IDM. This is, think of it like Uber for your parcel. How much visibility do we give our customers over their parcels when they're being delivered by the US Postal Service? Does the recipient know when the parcel is going to be delivered? Can they change their mind while the parcel is in the delivery van? Can they choose a delivery window? Can they rate their delivery driver? These are all things that we in the postal sector need to embrace because our competitors are doing it. And we want to make sure that those e-commerce shoppers choose the US Postal Service, choose it, not find themselves defaulted to it, if you can use default as a verb, but they want, we want them to actually choose it because we want the US Postal Service to be the best. So it comes back to those first three points, best people, best network, post office and delivery, best tech. All right. Returns are another part of this. So how can the US Postal Service become the leader in returns? And not by default, not just because it's there, but making the best use of that network. Another, another uh, idea for last mile delivery is, of course, value added services. We mentioned, I heard mentioned that previous presentation about uh, what's it called, you know, interacting with smart cities and monitoring potholes and broken windows and things like that through putting sensors inside of delivery vehicles. Well, how about actually use the person when they're at the doorstep doing a delivery saying, what did you think of your delivery experience today when you shopped with Acme flowers or whatever it is, right? Use that point of contact because this is something the US Postal Service has that the e-commerce retailers don't. So you can use that strength to help your customers, in this case, the customers being the e-commerce retailers. Same day delivery, it's talked about a lot. It's perhaps a niche service, but again, why can't the US Postal Service do that when it comes to creating excellence in delivery? So again, it comes back to the tech, comes back to having the resources available as well. <clears throat> and buy-in from every level, from management through to the worker. Everybody has to be committed to that. Just on that, and Erica, I must be running real close to running out of time now. So I'll just make one last point. And that is about sophisticated delivery options. So how can the US Postal Service, taking advantage of its excellent network and its excellent people, also find innovative ways to deliver. I mentioned time slot delivery. I mentioned predicting delivery. Same day delivery is an example. Can we do in-home delivery? Who would you trust more than your postman to deliver inside your house? Can we do all kinds of other delivery options that are out there right now? So those are just a few thoughts, I guess, to spark debate. And I'll have a look through the comments over there. Well, they're over there on my screen. They might be over there on your screen. But I'll have a look through the comments soon and see if anybody's got any comments, I'll try and respond to them. And I know, uh, Erica, we're going to have a, a panel discussion soon. So I'm bracing myself for that. Erica, back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. And you know, we, we were able to make up some time from some earlier panels. So you know, you, you haven't taken us over and your your safety is secure. Welcome. More Rats. Yes. <laughs> but um, so thank you for that. And uh, we're going to move on now to Julia Koenig from the World Wildlife Foundation. 
Hello, thank you. I'm just gonna to share some slides here. Uh, so I am Julia Kernick. I'm director of innovation startups at the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, I realize it's a, a little bit strange to, to hear that I'm presenting at this, uh, but I am on a team that really looks at major issues and trends that are facing the food, agriculture, and soft commodity worlds. And then my specific role in that is to look for new business models and new business strategies that are not only environmentally sustainable and socially impactful, but also financially profitable so that they can really scale and grow beyond us uh, and, and take hold. Uh, and I am very excited to be here and to talk to you a little bit about Farmers Post, uh, which I do believe could be one of those solutions and, and was kindly previewed a little bit by Sarah a couple presentations ago. So the idea for this really came up last spring when I was experiencing and watching probably the same issues that pretty much all of you were. Uh, so I, I work with a lot of farmers and what I was hearing from them uh, and was in the news at the time was how quickly markets pivoted and how much food was getting wasted. Uh, farmers who were selling to restaurants, to schools, to institutions really had their markets ripped away overnight. So food was being left in fields, it was being plowed back under and it was just left to rot. But while this was happening, grocery store shelves were bare. Uh, our, we are really seeing how broken our food supply chain is in this country. Uh, so consumers were staying home. They weren't going to restaurants. We were you know, worried about safety and going out. But even for those who could afford food, finding it was a difficulty. And certainly the ranks of people who cannot afford food were growing quickly at the time as well. Uh, all of this was happening while the, there were a lot of headlines at the time about how the Postal Service was facing a revenue shortfall and sort of looming fiscal year deadlines around that. And so I began to ponder, is there a way to, to, to be a win for all of these groups and to use the post office to get food directly from farmers to consumers? Uh, and I think Farmers Post is one, you know, one solution here that might help address some of these hurdles. Uh, so... At a very basic level, it would be using the expertise uh, and national distribution network, especially around that last mile distribution that so many of you have talked about to get food straight from farmers to local consumers. There would have to be some type of virtual aggregator uh, or web portal of, of some sort so that all of you as consumers could go put in your zip code, see the farms and place all the orders right on that one site. This also means that on the farming side, uh, each farm doesn't have to come up with their own website. They don't have to figure out how to take online orders. They don't have to market to consumers on their own. All of that is built into one platform and one sort of overarching aggregator here. Uh, that could also be then linked into the post office web and sort of data, getting back at some of the tech points as well. So that when a consumer places an order, uh, the farmer is not only getting the order, but getting the label that can go on a standardized box uh, that, you know, the pickup could be scheduled as well for the farmer so they don't have to go online and do that on their own. So making use of all services that already exist, but trying to streamline it and put it more on the back end as opposed to individual farmers and consumers having to do that. To get into a little bit of the nitty gritty there, because I'm sure this is the audience that, that would appreciate that, uh, this is, not a change of behavior really for anyone involved. It's based off of the regional rate system that already exists uh, and focusing specifically on delivering in zones one and two. Uh, there's no cold chain involved. Uh, I know that question will come up since it doesn't already exist. So we're not you know, advocating shipping milk and meat anytime soon, but focusing on produce, you know, vegetables, fruits, you know, possibly nuts that can make it 24 hours without cold chain. And that's a lot of the reason for the zones one and two as well. So the post office already delivers with the regional rate system within 24 hours for zones one and two, which is a pretty large area. Uh, if you put in your zip code and see what that entails, it's more than you would want for what would be a really local and regional food system. There would have to be an additional box size or two that would be specific to farmer's post because the original box sizes right now in that system all have one dimension that's too narrow for fresh produce. 
And then I think that every door direct mail would also be a great tool here for marketing uh, and possibly even sign up for people who don't have access or are not comfortable getting online to order. This is a potentially very large market. Uh, in the last year, people have really changed how they go about ordering food. We've heard that about e-commerce in general, but it has certainly been true of food in the past year with COVID. Uh, you can see a graph here of some of the major delivery options, which none are truly national and do not you know, exist absolutely everywhere. And while if you look, look quickly, the lines might look like they are not increasing, it is a percent change map. And so even those steady lines across are showing you know, 50, 100 or more percent change in the past year. And experts expect this to last. Uh, so people are comfortable ordering now. They have established habits. They like cooking at home. They're more used to it. While it might not be at the same numbers it is now, people don't think it will go back to where it was before either. And this has a chance to be a truly national program. Uh, so there are vegetable farms, as you can see here, really across almost all of the country, especially because it doesn't have to be in just your county, it just has to be in zones one and two. Uh, we tend to think of California as the breadbasket because it is for commercial farms. But when you're talking about local regional food systems, you don't need those massive commercial farms. What's exciting about this is it means this could also be a program that reaches all consumers. Uh, a lot of the major delivery options right now only serve urban areas or higher income areas. Uh, this has a chance to reach all areas and areas that otherwise don't have access to food. And we really believe it could be a win for all the players involved. So on the post office side, it's increased revenues. Uh, we put out a business case, which Erica kindly mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, and it you know, forecasted in a very small uptake, about one and a half billion annually, up to around six billion annually with about 10% uptake. Uh, it is a branding opportunity. So you know, delivering food for all with Farmers Post, a chance to co-brand, to work together, and, and to be the face of that. And it's just chance to recenter the post office as a center of communities, which I, I think is a point that came up in some of the comments already as well in the chat. Uh, you know, you could even have farmers markets at the post office as a kickoff event to build awareness uh, and allow people to sign up. It's certainly a win for consumers. It's a chance to get fresh, healthy produce direct to your door. Uh, and is, you know, seeing that map that it's something that it could be accessible to everyone. The post office already has rates that are far more affordable than at existing levels without having to even lower them at a far more affordable than current delivery food services that often add, you know, 35% or more on top for things like Instacart. And it, if you have a virtual aggregator and you did pilot something like this and it worked, it has the ability to go national almost immediately because the USPS already goes to nearly every door every day. And it's a chance to be safe if you are you know, immunocompromised or otherwise cannot get to a grocery store. It's a win for farmers. It's more revenue for them and an ability to reach new customers uh, so that they are not trying to figure out how to market uh, and reach different new consumer groups. It also is not just for farmers who are even selling direct to consumer, but brings the certainty for those who are selling elsewhere. So if they're selling to restaurants or groceries and those change in the future, and those contracts come after growing season start, uh, they can now easily sell that surplus to the local community. And it links them into that community. And of course, since I'm here from World Wildlife Fund, it is a win for the environment. We waste two to 50% of our specialty crops even before COVID. We believe those rates have gone up, uh, which is incredibly scary when you think of how many hungry people there are in all footprint. And it does this using an existing asset, USPS, so you're not adding emissions elsewhere. This is very much a conversation starter. There's a long way to go, but there's been excitingly a lot of enthusiasm so far. Uh, so I have a series of questions here of some of the ones we want to answer and we think are the, the next steps and questions to answer. And I'm hoping that all of you here can be a, a part of that. Uh, my email is right here, so feel free to reach out. I will also be sticking around for the brainstorming sessions and really look forward to talking about it more and hearing all of your insight and advice. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Julia. I, I saw in the in the in the chat as you were speaking, uh, Kimberly Carroll mentioning using a similar service as I have, and I'm like, wow, it's so much prefer to get my my ugly fruits uh, from the postal service than um, uh, th this is just exciting to hear. So thank you, and thank you, Ian, for your uh, for your great uh, presentation and, and information around tech. So as promised, we now have some time for questions from all of you. And remember, if you have a question, it's best to identify yourself by hitting the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. But if you can't find that, you can also literally just raise your hand on the screen or call yourself in the chat. And then we'll call on you, ask you to unmute yourself, and then you can direct your question to one of our speakers. So uh, we have our speakers up now so that you can see their names. And we have a question. Our first question uh, is from Deb Klein with Cleveland Jobs with Justice. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you, Erica. Julia, I have a question. I, you said that you saw this program servicing urban areas. Do you anticipate any pushback from existing urban farm markets and high-end grocery stores? Uh, thank you, Deborah, and for the question. So we, we certainly see it serving urban areas, but we see it serving all areas, so not exclusive to urban areas. I To me, I, I think it's possible there are a few pushbacks from farmers markets, uh, but I really, I don't think it will be tremendous because I think it is complementary rather than competing. There's a lot of people who will still absolutely want to go to farmers markets. I know I love getting to go and pick out fruit and look at it, have that, you know, face-to-face -face discussion with farmers. I think a lot of the people who do that will continue to do that, but this will allow the market to expand for people who either don't have a farmer's market towards them or the time's inconvenient or they simply can't get there. Uh, so, my guess is it grows the total market quite a bit rather than taking people who are already going to a farmer's market away from them. Thank you, Julia. We have another question from Stephanie Apollon from uh, the uh, Save the USPS Coalition. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Save the Post Office Coordinator at Take on Wall Street. Um, we come to this table with an interest in advancing postal banking here in the United States. Um, we'll be discussing more about postal banking tomorrow, but I had a question for Ian that seemed to fit um, your presentation. Uh, we know that many postal services around the world provide significantly more financial services than we do here in the U.S. So is there any way in which postal financial services um, helps post offices leverage their network advantages in the parcel networks? Um, it seems to me that a person might be more inclined to have a package shipped through the post office if you're also paying through the post office or being reimbursed for a return at the post office? Not sure there's any conclusive data about whether or not postal banking has any, any impact on the usage of other postal services such as e-commerce. Um, I know that there have been very few posts that have taken on postal banking in the last 20 years. In fact, most examples of postal, well, a number of examples of postal banking around the world have actually been reducing their, their networks. So it's, it's, it's not an easy question to answer when it comes to postal banking because every country is different. And the reasons why you look at postal banking differs from country to country, whether it's a, you know, I won't go into it in great depth because I know there's going to be a huge amount of discussion about this over the next two days. And I don't want to steal anybody's thunder on it. Um, but to this point, I'm not aware of any correlation between postal banking and the willingness to engage with e-commerce. I will make one quick comment though, and that's been around posts offering prepaid debit cards. So if you're a person who is either unbanked or a person who has limited banking or very simple arrangements with your bank, you may choose to take on a debit card which can be offered through the post office in association with a card player like MasterCard or Visa, et cetera, et cetera. And load that card with cash. So you're not worried about credit issues. And then you can use that to shop online in a secure way without any undue financial risk as well. So that is one part where it's sort of pseudo banking, shall we say, but it has had an impact or a boost for e-commerce and use of the post. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Stephanie, and thank you for the answer, Ian. Uh, next up, we have Steve DiMatteo. Hey, I just want to thank all the panelists for the great presentations. My question is directed at Ian. Uh, Ian, 
I'm sure you're familiar with the figures, but the, the Postal Service here was really uh, feeling the crush of the holiday season this year. I think uh, COVID certainly explains most of it. Uh, but millions of more people turned to the post to deliver gifts, to order things to their homes. Did, did other posts have a similar experience? And do you have any insight as to how, how they did with that? And I guess another question is, are other posts around the world expecting some of that additional shift to, to be sticky? Are they thinking more of the people that are shopping online and shipping through the mail? Do they expect them to, to be customers in, in the post for the long haul? So last question first, yes, most surveys seem to indicate that customers intend to keep shopping online. Some will shop at the existing pandemic level, shall we say, others might return to uh, regular face-to-face -face bricks and water shopping, but supplement that with e-commerce shopping. So yes, there will be an enduring boost to parcels. With regard to coping with peak 2020, it was out of this world. But again, this is where different posts coped with it differently. I mean, you look at, say, Australia. Australia Post has 80% of the B2C market. Now, its biggest week, this past peak season, which actually was a week before the biggest peak in 2019. And that was because of the massive public awareness campaign saying, people, please do your ordering and your shopping early, because otherwise we might not be able to deliver the promise. And the other difference there is that at, to this point, uh, many other posts around the world don't have Amazon dumping parcels on them at the last minute. I'm not going to criticize Amazon or say anything, give any more depth of, of analysis around that, but that is a factor that um, you know, other posts don't have to deal with to the same extent as the US Postal Service. And this comes back to, again, though, to this idea of being the carrier of last resort. If you can be not the carrier of last resort, but the carrier of choice, you've got more control over those volumes and you're able to offer a better quality of service. I hope I've given you enough there without taking over the discussion too much. Thank you. Thank you both. Next up, we have Nelson Betancourt with a question also for Ian. One moment, Nelson, we'll need you to unmute yourself there. I think we get the permission going. Okay. Uh, Ian, I have a question for you. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, community currencies. Is there is there a possibility that uh, that the postal service could uh, could play a role in developing or be a, uh, a developer for a community currency to help small businesses? Oh, so I don't quite understand what you mean by community currency. Can you just give me a little bit more detail what that yeah, means? Community currencies are generally currencies that are only used locally for local businesses. Right. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, and um, you know, in, in England they have the, they're all over the world. I believe there's several thousand all over the world. But in England they've developed them quite well. In the United States they have several that are doing quite well. But my idea is that with all this all this uh, uh, business coming back to to our local regions, if you will, the development of community currencies through the uh, post office being that they are that there's so much trust in the postal service. Have you looked at that? Is How would you look at that? Is there a possibility? Well, it certainly is a possibility. And when it comes to governments, if a government wants something to happen, especially when it's spending money, it can, it can make it happen. Now, yeah. there is a real need to stimulate local small businesses in the wake of the pandemic, because many of those local small businesses suffered because they weren't able to sell online and weren't set up for that. So there's an opportunity for the post by the mm. way, as a, as, a, as a side note there. So there is an opportunity there for the post. With regards to like a local currency, I guess mo most of the examples I've seen of that have actually been tied to things like welfare payments. So, um, and that can work, but obviously there's a political debate around that and a social responsibility debate. Um, but just the same, the post can play a role there if it's going to talk, we're talking about say preloaded cards. So you might have a debit card that's preloaded with currency, but you can only use in that community or for certain purposes. Now, there's right. a social debate around that and a political debate as well, mm -hmm. but it can work. Um, you just have to make sure you have a lot of consultation and make sure you understand what you're getting into. I think that's a short answer. What's really very long, could really be a long answer, if that makes sense, Nelson. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nelson. And uh, next up, we have a question from Jamie Partridge. Go ahead, Jamie. Hi, uh, Jamie Partridge, retired letter carrier and organizer with Communities and Postal Workers United. I have a question for um, either Judy Beard or Mark Dimenstein um, from with the American Postal Workers Union. Um, I know you're going into a contract uh, um, campaign uh, in the in this coming year, and in the past uh, you've raised issues like postal banking or other issues related to the common good. Um, you know, and some of the things that we've talked about this morning. Um, uh, and I'm wondering what it, what is your thinking going into this period about the kind of uh, the kind of issues related to uh, the common good, <laughs> the uh, public um, in the in the contract campaign uh, negotiations, and how can the public um, be part of you know pushing postal management to do the right thing? Um, I'm not personally involved in the contract campaign. However, uh, in the legislative area, we are, are going to be working toward getting a pilot in post offices. Uh, right now, the, um, the House is uh, uh, looking at including in their appropriations bill. Um, $2 million for the post office. I believe uh, that's gonna be introduced. It was introduced in the last house in the 116th Congress and it didn't go anywhere. But um, there have been meetings uh, continuously, not a campaign, but meetings uh, trying to get uh, the post office pilot programs going. We believe that once those pilot programs are going successfully, then it's no reason why they wouldn't be nationwide. This, this is postal banking you're talking about? Yes. Great. So thank you. I think we've hit our questions. I'm gonna give it a moment to see if there are any other outstanding questions. And if not, we will move on. And seeing no hands. Great. Well, thank you all. Before moving on, just another another round of thanks to um, to our fa fantastic uh, uh, panelists. Oh, actually, a final question before before we shift out. You know, maybe Judy or, or Monique or Sarah, if you could talk about sort of what's what some of the opposition is, what's some what's standing in the way of some of the proposals that you've laid out that you know we want to be able to move forward with now. You know, now that we're moving from the defensive stance, but um, but now that we have you know a more you know uh, proactive posture, what what are what is what's in our way? What do we need to look out for? So Judy or Monique or Sarah. Um, so some of the things that are standing in the way are, are people, members of Congress. Uh, the Postal Service needs money to do some of these things, and um, if they could get the money um, that they need in infrastructure, or if they can get the money that they need through, you know, any type of resolution, then they could get, um, you know, more things done for the postal service. And if they took service standards very serious, because um, right now, if people can't get their medicine, if the mail is so slow, we're going to lose business. So we have to do everything we can to increase the service standards, to give the people what uh, they deserve. I, I could say a couple more things about that. I mean, I think um, throughout the Postal Service history, when it has done these incredible innovations, there have been private like self-interest that have tried to block them. And I've looked into the history of the introduction of the parcel post and uh, companies like Wells Fargo Express saw this as competition for them and tried to block it. Today, we couldn't imagine the country without um, the Postal Service delivering packages. So it was, you know, Congress um, stood strong on that one and came through with it. Today, we're seeing the big banks trying to oppose postal banking or expansion of postal financial services because it, they see it as, as competition, even though they have neglected a lot of these communities for years and aren't providing services in a lot of low-income communities. And then again, what, what Judy said about the money when the Postmaster General testified recently and said that he would only commit to 10% of the, post, the new vehicles for the postal 
service to be electric, um, he said it was because of money and, and that if Congress came through with additional funding. And I think there's one where we need to look at the cost of not transforming the, the uh, vehicle fleet because the cost of you know, climate change plus all of the, you know, the fuel and other costs associated with our, the fossil fuel vehicles that, that they have now is going to be much bigger than um, biting the bullet now and really um, transforming the, the fleet to be um, heavily electric. Thanks, Sarah. Monique, did you have anything to add to Judy's and Sarah's comments? No, I completely agree with both of them. I just wanted to say that also it's been our experience that the industries that feel threatened will throw, will go blazes against any suggestion, whether it's modest or large. So you might as well go large because you're going to get the same reaction, whether or not you're trying to tiptoe around them or, you know, or, or really actually threaten their business interests. So, um, and this has been the case for many uh, different similar initiatives. Great advice there, Monique. Thank you. Yes, might as well go large, right? So yeah, yeah. Put up the yeah, you know, go for it, go for gold. Go